When God said to be fruitful and multiply, well, let me just interrupt here. Um, that's been interpreted to be uh, uh, a, a, a proscription against any sort of birth control. But other theologians have interpreted that to be a blessing. It's like you would tell somebody, go out and have a great time. It's not an order. It's not a rule. It's a blessing. And uh, to a world uh, where it was basically wildly underpopulated at that time, um, that is a great blessing to see your seed go on. And anyway, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the way I wish more Christians would interpret that very important line. When God said to be fruitful and multiply, I can't believe he wanted us to become a writhing mass of flesh wallowing in poisonous wastes. Somebody should let him know, hey, look, God, we did it. Five billion, and so fast. Can we stop now? And it'll be six and a half billion by the year 2000. Let me give you a great statistic. I put this in a speech for Senator Douglas one time. If population was to continue to increase at the present rate indefinitely, by 3530 AD, the total mass of human flesh and blood would equal the mass of the Earth. By 6826 AD, it would equal the mass of the known universe. Of course, that statistic is several years old. I hear we've slowed somewhat. Paul Chadwick said, by the year 7,000, we'll outweigh the universe. Is there a maximum sustainable population for the Earth? At 5 billion, we've already passed some early guesses at that number, and we're still here. Well, but we're only still here on a kind of an overshoot basis, which is to say that we may have overshot the carrying capacity of the Earth, and the crash will come after we use up all the oil and all the groundwater, and then we will have a, what, what ecologists would call a massive die-off. And since we don't want that, we need to uh, start scaling back now very rapidly. As for a maximum sustainable number, there, uh, there is a great disagreement amongst demographers and ecologists as to how big that number might be, because there's a bunch of random factors, including technological advances and uh, uh, plagues that we can't predict. And these kind of things uh, make it very hard to pre and also lifestyles. At what, at what minimum uh, lifestyle do you want to set before you can um, uh, begin to calculate this number. So that I've heard um, th some people say that if you really wanted to put it at the lowest number possible, I mean the lowest level of, of, of livability possible, that, you, that the Earth might be able to support 30 billion people. Although when that number was proposed at a conference that I was at, everybody else just groaned and said, no, 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 that's quite, quite impossible. So the, and there are also deep ecologists who say that the natural number of humans on Earth ought to be about 100 million. So when you have some people saying 100 million and some people saying 30 billion, you realize that the range of, of disagreement on this topic is so huge that it almost is not a, a useful thing to talk about optimum number of people, but rather first begin to figure out what kind of lifestyle we want to uh, agree to reach and then how we might go about doing it. Yes, we'll never get anywhere if we have no idea where we're going. Today, three babies are born every second. Nancy? How many have been born since I started this broadcast? Wow, busy little species, aren't we? Overpopulation became a hot topic in science fiction in 1966 with Harry Harrison's novel, Make Room, Make Room. Set in the year 1999, New York seethes with 35 million inhabitants, and yet police officer Andy Rush is lonely. Then John Brunner won the Hugo Award for his 1968 tour de force Stand on Zanzibar, about a future super-saturated with people, pollution, technology, and information. After those landmark works, other SF authors explored the issue more through metaphor. In the bestseller The Moat in God's Eye, Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell created a race of aliens who simply could not practice Planned Parenthood. Oh, and check out the sequel, The Gripping Hand. Both Larry and Jerry are among the substantial group of SF authors who see clear solutions to overpopulation. Historically, the only limit to population growth has been wealth. Think about it for a while. Wars don't do it. Repression doesn't do it. But wealthy societies tend to, have to be fairly stable and not to have runaway population growth. And they're the only ones that do. No others ever have. Okay, let's make everybody rich. 
before we've got 20 billion people to burden the earth with, and there's so darn many that you can't do anything about it. How are we going to make everybody rich? Well, we better have a big expansion in the resource base. We better have res resources, energy, and ingenuity, and freedom have always produced wealth. And I know nothing else that does. Take, take human beings give them some freedom, give them some energy, access to energy, access to resources, and get the heck out of their way, and they produce wealth. Interesting theory. In Joe Haldeman's The Forever War, technology didn't make everyone wealthy because it was used to build a massive war machine. As the expanding human race colonizes the galaxy, interstellar war erupts against aliens. Because faster-than-light battle cruisers experience time dilation, each tour of duty means the hero a lowly grunt named William Mandela is away from Earth for centuries at a time. By the time peace finally arrives, human beings are overflowing the galaxy. If the Forever War was really an exploration of your experience in Vietnam, why did you also use it to tackle the issue of overpopulation? Well, it's a thing that uh, when you talk about war, when you talk about large-scale war, you have to include overpopulation as a driver, as a, a prime uh, driver behind the necessity for it. The only way we're going to get into the future is for people to either stop reproducing so fast or kill them off fast enough that the high birth rates don't uh, uh, deprive us all of food and drink and space and air and so forth. Um, I'm, I am dystopic about that all of these forces for good in the world, telling people to have more and more babies, it's all gonna work out all right. No, it's not, there's already too many people. At the end of the forever war, the government is actively encouraging homosexuality as a form of birth control. Do you think Western civilization is ready for some sort of legislated population control? Yeah, it just, uh, it's not, it wouldn't work. Uh, we are used to having a lot of freedom and to deprive people of something so personal uh, just wouldn't go. What we need is to educate people and have them make the decision themselves. I, when I got married 27 years ago, I told my wife we are not going to have any children because having people in our economic and uh, racial class having children is a sin. Uh, so she agreed, and we haven't. Uh, an African man wants to have a large family just to, to take the opposite side of it. You take an African farmer who has no income except what he can make out of a couple of acres of bad ground. And he knows that uh, when he's 50, he's going to be an old man. And the government is not going to take care of him. The only way he has a chance of surviving is to have a son to take care of him. Okay, half his children die in childbirth, so he has to have two to have a child. Half his children are female and therefore worthless. So he has to have four in order to have a male child. His odds of having a male child who will actually take care of him are optimistically 50-50. He has to have eight in order to have one responsible adult child who will take care of him in his old age. And he didn't figure out this in terms of arithmetic. He just looked around him and saw how few of his comrades who were were comfortable in their old age, and those few all had sons. So, okay, I'm not trying to talk to him. I can't talk him out of having eight children. But I can show people who have social systems that take care of them in their old age. I can show them how much they're wasting of the world's resources, just how much they're eating up of their own children and grandchildren's world. Legislated birth control is strictly enforced in Barry B. Longyear's novel, Sea of Glass. Young Thomas Wyndham, an illegal child, is kept in hiding. But at the age of seven, he pries open the locked and blackened window of his attic hideaway to catch his first glimpse of blue sky. But he's spotted by a nosy neighbor. Boom, the authorities arrive and Thomas is whisked away to a labor camp. His parents are executed on international TV for the selfish crime of parenthood. <laughs> 